Hello, I think we are live. Welcome. We'll give a few minutes to let others join on the YouTube. We can't exactly see how many people are on there yet, but. How's everyone doing? Monday, you guys are in your midday. We have a gradient. We have the Monday evening, Monday midday, and I'm at Monday morning. It has been a great day. Okay. I'm looking wish forward you, to it. Wish you a great Monday as well. Yeah, I'm still starting as well. So. Nice, nice. We had a great presentation last week or maybe it was a week and a half ago um, with Ari Melanciano, who is a computational artist and tech maker. And we're having in this um, series of lectures, inviting you and a few others to discuss your work and introduce you to some of the residents. Um, I'll start out by introducing ourselves. I'm Carmen, and I'm part of Python Labs. Sorry. This is AJ here. And we are uh, running a, I guess I'll start. So I think everyone should be here. Um, <clears throat> we are part of Python Labs, and we are a design studio that looks at the intersections and explores absurdities and fantasies and where we um, find the edges of technology, art, and science um, and remix the past and the future. We are working with Dijkter Holland and Camp Nagel as we host the current residency of The Host Is. Um, ours is called Anything to Declare, Thinking Outside the Border. It is an interdisciplinary research-led residency that is looking to redefine the um, spaces, the real and imagined spaces, the digital and physical spaces um, and experiences of everyday life by uncovering some of the um, divisions, the boundaries and the borders that um, present themselves in our world through a few different forms, through a topography and ecological space, through the body, looking at the combination of hardware, software, and where the body intersects with um, both of those, and through a um, post-capitalist um, kind of sharing economy, looking at the commons and how we can kind of smudge the borders uh, and the binaries that have defined how we interact in the world. Um, Ajay and I have been working with three artists and uh, for the past about three months, and we are going to be presenting the work in Hamburg in uh, December 15th is the opening. And in this small lecture series, we are inviting three different artists to speak to the different technologies that they're using, the approaches that they take to their work as a, in a way to ground us in what is um, what other artists are working on in our community and also uh, to inspire us. So with that, uh, I'd love to pass this over to Eje as we introduce our next speaker. Um, thank you, Jose, for joining us today. So, hi, everyone. We have Jose Sanchez with us here today. Um, he's an architect, programmer, and game designer. He's based in Detroit. Uh, he's currently running the uh, Plethora project. He's a director of that project. It is a research and learning project investing in the future of online open source knowledge. He has been teaching and he has taught and guest lectured in many places, including the AA in London, uh, Angevante in Vienna, uh, ETH Zurich, the Bartlett School of Architecture here in London, and also UCL and many others. He is the 
creator of Blockhood and Commonhood, uh, two award-winning video games exploring notions of crowdsourced urbanism, rediscovering the commons in an age of social networks. Um, in his talk today, Entangled Simulations, he'll be discussing the tensions and affordances of compounding narrative structures and simulation softwares. Thanks again, Jose, for joining us, and I uh, will leave you the stage. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Eche and Carmen, for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to get started here. Um, let me know if you can see my screen. Is that good? OK, so I'm going to go ahead. Um, so thanks again for the introduction. Um, I would like to start with a, with a note on what I'm going to be discussing as entangled realism. Um, as mentioned, I'm an architect. Uh, I recently moved to the city of Detroit. I'm originally from Chile. Uh, and I was really uh, touched by the work of Diego Rivera, who has developed some of the murals um, here in the Detroit Institute of Arts. Um, for me, Rivera really brings us to um, the time in which art was really engaging politically uh, and really kind of depicting very figuratively uh, some of the working conditions that, that made Detroit the city it was at the time. Um, not alluding uh, to some of the kind of social and political conflicts of that time. In many ways, uh, the work of Rivera um, resonates with the time uh, that we're living in, right? A series of conditions that uh, perhaps ought to be included in the models of uh, design and computation or kind of any form of modeling that we might take uh, part on. Being a Chilean architect uh, and a designer, uh, I'm certainly influenced by some of the social movements that are happening in my country, specifically uh, the call for kind of a, a shift towards a new constitution, a process that is still under uh, in the making uh, with, with a, a lot of conflict and, and certainly kind of uh, driving a question of what should a 21st century constitution be like, which I think every Chilean is considering. And one of the movements that came out of, of, of such a campaign in a way was uh, for a third habitat, which is Por un Habitat Digno, which is a kind of an architecture uh, students and professors collective that actually went to the street, streets to kind of really demarcate uh, the living conditions that have been offered by forms of neoliberal practices. Um, it is not coincidence that this movement takes the form of a mural similar to Rivera, um, in this case, in, the, in, in public space, occupying the street and really inviting a different conversation uh, with an audience. In my view, the work of Rivera uh, purposely moves away from the gallery and attempts to kind of create a dialogue uh, with the public sphere. It's not only what is in display, how figuratively those figures are kind of manifested, but also who sits to engage with the art. Um, switching, uh, I wanted to add a, a small commentary on some of the kind of uh, new tools that we're seeing with artificial intelligence. And, and I, I often I don't discuss this work, but I think it's, it's interesting to introduce uh, what I see as a problem of ontology. Uh, for me, the, the idea of ontology is what we include in a model, right? When we think about computational modeling and, and computational design, uh, what we include in the model and what we leave out by, by the same coin uh, defines that model's ontology, who has a voice in that model. And I think that uh, it's interesting that when we engage with ideas of AI, uh, these are kind of text to image generated, uh, images produced with mid-journey, um, I really kind of started considering how these images could be considered as ontological prose, right? A form of exploration of what are the possible ontologies? What are the kind of representations? And what do we want to include in the depictions of design um, that we want to put out there, right? Uh, specifically in this case, um, I was looking at how uh, salvage materials, uh, adaptive reuse, how compositional arrangements of materials that might be rendered otherwise uh, unuseful could be recombined by a form of AI to render a form of compositional value. Uh, and I'm not arguing necessarily that these are successful, but I think that it's interesting to start kind of considering that any computational model has 
an ontological proposition and one that we can wield in different ways. So I'm going to be referring to this term ontology in computational models quite a bit throughout this presentation uh, to really engage, again, who has a voice uh, and who doesn't, um, and who are these kind of images produced for, what kind of the imaginaries that are kind of putting forward. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Uh, I, I Not so long ago, a couple of years ago, I, I finished a, a publication called The Architecture for the Commons. And I really want to use the book um, for those that might not have the chance to read it. Read it to give you a, a, a quick uh, rundown of, of what is argued there. Um, but at the same time, it's a framework which that I used to operate and develop uh, all sorts of different projects from video games to architecture. So it really, uh, the, the project of the architecture for the common starts with a critique of a model of architectural progress or design progress as has been uh, portrayed by ideas of parametrics, specifically by firms like Sarah Hadid Architects with uh, leaders like Patrick Schumacher, um, that really argue for um, a model that, uh, you know, how can we do more with less? This is an idea that was developed by, by Mr. Fuller uh, with the notion of ephemeralization. Um, and in my view, this idea, uh, while sound in terms of like the promise of technology of being able to do more with less, uh, it really didn't, didn't play out the way it was suggested it would. It wouldn't bring the prosperity that we were always expecting from technology. As a matter of fact, the opposite became true. It became, you know, more profits for less, you know, uh, people rather than having prosperity. So um, really analyzing critically the model of how we advance technology and what that entails. One of the big te technological paradigms that is being uh, currently being developed is that of vertical integration, specifically through what I call the coalescence of parts. This means that 3D printing technologies are able to reduce the number of parts uh, in a design of an assembly. And this could actually be seen very specifically in the, in the design of uh, rockets and specifically the engines, the 3D printed engines for for uh, space exploration. Um, the company Relativity Space makes a strong case of how the reduction of parts uh, plays an important role of optimizing uh, the engine, right? What we see is that we have less and less parts in the model, but at the same time, we have less actors participating in the economy of production, right? What we see is a vertical integration that kind of consolidates who gets to build what. Certainly, with the argument that performance uh, increase would actually yield a better result, but again, that result reduces uh, the actors or what we would like to consider a multi-actor economy. So the coalescence of parts is something that we can uh, see quite uh, clearly in the tectonics of buildings and the ideas of design. And it has a very strong economic implication, uh, again, of who gets to build such structures and as, as these structures move forward. Uh, the coalescence of parts also, it's very tied to the right to repair movement. Uh, when we think about companies such as Apple, who have done proprietary uh, technologies such as the pentalobe screw. These are a form of anti-tampering technologies that would uh, keep out people from altering and modifying the device or repairing the device, right? So there's a sense of uh, exclusion and, and basically an economy of a walled garden. Um, so what I tried to make an argument in the book is a defense of parts not through performance, which is clearly kind of a, a losing battle, but perhaps through the social affordances or the economic social affordances of, of a multi-actor economy, right? Uh, so in this case, uh, when we think about design, uh, thinking of a, of a design that actually has a closed topology, like a jigsaw puzzle, uh, really it's, it's not perhaps the most efficient way of thinking about cooperation and collaboration, but rather if we think of an open topology, more like a Lego, we could actually start thinking of combinatorial surplus, right? Which is an idea that I put forward of how parts could have live in different contexts and create a kind of an economic surplus beyond the, the instance where they're designed. And I use projects such as the Bloom project, which I'm gonna show a few slides further ahead, or friends of, uh, of mine from Gilles Retzin, other people that are kind of participating and, and, and discussing what is this idea of a discrete project and a sense of uh, discrete set of parts that 
could allow that knowledge is encapsulated, but also shared beyond a specific building. Finally, the book discusses if we are within a paradigm of permutation of parts and the kind of combinatorial encounter of parts, perhaps the immaterial architectures, meaning software, meaning uh, literacies, meaning kind of the, everything that would surround the design itself, it starts becoming more relevant. And that's what I call a material architecture using references from Jonah Friedman, who designed Flat Rider in 1967, a concept of a software that would actually uh, enable users to kind of reconfigure their living environment, but also looking at video games, contemporary video games as forms of immaterial architecture that are opening the door for, for a new form of participation, right? Uh, while we're not quite there yet, um, there has been examples such as Folded, which is a protein folding game, or City Skylands that are models that are getting increasingly close to uh, being able to create a kind of a conversation with uh, real, real urban models. My own work with projects such as Blockhood and Commonhood, which again, I'm gonna show a little bit further, um, really tries to engage in that proposition. And finally, um, the idea of the commons, it's you know presented as how do we reconstruct the commons through self-provision? What are the kind of the infrastructures for the DIY um, that we can actually uh, develop? So, I mean, I'm gonna just cut this short as, you know, I, I don't have too much time to go further into this. So let me just take you to one of the first projects that really kind of got me started on working on social combinatorics. And that was the Bloom project. Uh, this was a project in 2012, so like 10 years ago. And, and it really kind of thought, how do we kind of break down an installation uh, to a component, again, like a Lego piece that could take different forms and it wouldn't be untouchable, but rather the opposite. It would be something that people could play with. Uh, in a way, uh, there was an argument that the patterns, the arrangements and the engagements of the public would render different forms of values and different organizations that might be contingent and meaningful for the different instances in which the project would be presented. The game would you know, play almost as an opposite Yenga. Um, players would, depending on the group or if they were working in, as individuals or as in groups, they would try to create different structures and engage with the project in uh, different scales. We presented it in several countries and uh, every time it would actually take a different form in a way, every design produced with a project was a was an act of participation, a token of participation, if you want. Uh, and the project was also kind of really deeply interested on kind of uh, an infrastructure for literacy. How do we kind of kind of involve the project within schools and think about the design of a, of a project that could also engage with education? Well, that project uh, operated in the physical domain. Um, I was very interested of really kind of taking some of these initiatives into uh, a digital counterpart, uh, which led me to design uh, a first video game project, which is called Blockhood. So Blockhood is a, a city building video game um, developed in 2016. It's roughly three years to be completed. I wanted to share this video with you uh, while I describe a little bit the project. So. In common, in Blockhood, you, you're basically designing a small uh, city block, right? You are invited to consider what are the ecological interdependencies between the tiles. Uh, you're not forced to do a tower by, by any means. Uh, you, can, you could actually just work with um, different kinds of tiles, but every tile would require a relationship with other tiles, right? Like if you create a like a tree, you might have to provide water for that tree. Or if you create a shop, you might need to provide consumers for the goods being sold there. So as you start building up anything that you decide to build, you would create the further requirements uh, that, the, that this building would actually have, right? So you're creating your own problems. You, you have to engage with your own uh, aspirations if you want, but also satisfying those. Um, the model really uh, here tries to kind of move away from an economic model. Uh, so it doesn't really put so much emphasis on how much things cost, but really puts a lot more emphasis on what is the, the ecological relationships between things? How do we maintain things alive? How do we maintain things like a beating heart that are kind of uh, 
not decaying, right? Like the counterpart of this model is that things gradually decay if they're not satisfied with their resources uh, that they, they need, right? Uh, so you will see in, in many instances that these buildings gradually explode or decay and kind of en enter a form of dystopian uh, representation, right? So that's kind of, the, 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 in a way, the fail state where the player might need to kind of revisit what went wrong, what are the kind of uh, resources that are not satisfied. Um, so, yeah, this is this is how the project kind of plays. For me, it was very important to really have a, a project that was public facing, right? So it wasn't a prototype of a video game, but it was an actual video game that people could, you know, engage, download from Steam, um, and and really kind of engage with the ideas very explicitly. Uh, and that process, <laughs> I can share more personally, has been quite you know, uh, challenging uh, because once you put something out in, in the world, like communities really uh, engage with them in all sorts of different ways. So this is the model behind the game, uh, the ecological dependencies that I mentioned. It's a system, it's a very, you know, simple kind of inputs and outputs model, but it really allows for kind of a deep entangled web of relationships. At any moment, a player can see the different data that, that the model is uh, calculating so that you could actually take decisions with that. And the proposition is that there is no optimal solution. Uh, the game is not inviting you to learn how to create the perfect building. It's actually the opposite. It's trying to suggest that many different patterns of urban organizations are possible and perhaps meaningful for the player. Um, and it wants to celebrate that. Um, so it's not really, I, I kind of really tried very hard to stay away from any converging form of metric, a score, let's say, or one metric that would actually uh, allow players to compare results to each other, um, really kind of celebrating the, the multiplicity of, of uh, diverse outcomes that could come out of the system. To testament of that, these are kind of images that we produce or we produce something with the community, different models of, of possible buildings that, that have different orientations. And similarly to Bloom, it's a project that really tries to uh, engage with the public very explicitly. Uh, we have been kind of running an educational program. Uh, we've always kind of shared uh, free educational licenses and like have classrooms play the game and, and engage with the ideas of the project. And with that, I want to just uh, jump into perhaps my most recent project and, and perhaps the most kind of uh, more articulated uh, argument that I tried to make regarding uh, this idea of entangled simulations, right? I would like to start with the notion of a twin. Um, so in her book, uh, The Parable of the Sower, uh, Octavia Butler really confronts us with a very dire dystopian version of our reality. Uh, in her books, um, the setting of the novels really exacerbate a form of scarcity and a form of economic uh, struggle uh, that make the operation of every character be fundamentally driven by survival. Uh, nevertheless, you know, the characters of Butler do not operate as automatons in this background. They actually manage to distort and even question the payoff matrix of, uh, of such scarcity, right? So if we are to model the, the setting uh, in which such a, such a paradigm operates or such a kind of a novel would operate, we perhaps would gravitate to something like system dynamics, right? Where we could actually, similarly to the, to the games that I've shown, you could uh, think about inputs and outputs, caloric, caloric requirements for survival, metabolic rates. You could uh, really kind of model the ins and outs a, of um, satisfying a survival economy under scarcity. Um, and I'm using some of the, the diagrams from Turis, uh, Turis Dormas, which uh, created this beautiful uh, little visualization called machinations. So system dynamics uh, really is a kind of a very well-established framework for modeling systems. Um, but in a way, the, the model of system dynamics begs the question, what is the model's ontology? Right. By this, we mean 
who has a voice in the model. And I would like to kind of stop here and, and kind of use Mario Blaser's, uh, you know, a definition of ontology. And he describes there's a three layer definition of ontology. First, we can think about ontology as an inventory of beings and the relationships. Second, we can think about the particular social cultural or social natural configurations that those entities establish with each other. Um, we can think about the worlds that they produce, right? And how uh, these are enacted by practices. And finally, uh, ontologies are also manifest, in, manifest themselves as stories, you know? is the stories that we moderns tell ourselves what is happening in the world, right? What, it, what exists uh, and what has a voice in our current model of the world. So this is kind of borrowed from Arturo Escobar's design for the Pluriverse. Um, so Escobar had re really problematized the notion of political ontology, right? So we, we, the idea of problematizing uh, what he considers a universal ontology or like a one world world, right? Like how do we question that model and perhaps open, you know, imaginaries that are uh, more uh, pluriversal that do not fall into this one world idea. So when we actually start creating a, a digital model, uh, and this is very much the paradigm of digital twin technology, something that is, is happening quite a bit in industry uh, today, um, we are certainly faced with this ontological challenge, right? To what degree do we model uh, performance, uh, the different variables that kind of play into the system, in this case, let's say manufacturing, and to what degree do we model uh, labor, human resources, and perhaps aspects of uh, the personal life of uh, workers or, or, you know, we could, we could keep expanding this model to an arbitrary degree to define what is the model's uh, scope, right? But if we look back, this notion of using cybernetics and different forms of modeling, uh, it's not new. Uh, in, in Chile, as a matter of fact, in the the government of Salvador Allende, which was the regime just before the dictatorship, uh, introduced the model of cyber scene, which was an attempt to uh, create a cybernetic simulation, a form of digital twin in, in today's terms, uh, that would kind of regulate and counterbalance uh, the the economic um, the economy of, of Chile, right? Um, and I want to create a kind of a counter a counter narrative. Uh, similarly to Butler, I think that there's a, something that it's not completely captured by this, this, what we would call this first ontology, right? The ontology of a system dynamics model that could be a quite literally model. And for that, I would like to use the work of Jeremy Deller. Um, so it's important that we start considering how the model that we are using when we're actually designing a system ought to be including us. And this, this idea of Second order, second order cybernetics, uh, again, you know, ref, referred by Arturo Escobar, uh, brings to the foreground the notion that we cannot uh, rely on, on, a, on a sense of objectivity, but we rather kind of include ourselves and our own observations in the model itself. We also ought to be problematizing the scalability of a model, right? A model that is scalable, and again, this is an argument done by Anna Singh in her book, The Mushroom at the End of the World, uh, Sacrifice scalability, which is a very common characteristic or, or kind of aspiration of computational systems to, to kind of reduce uh, indeterminacies and, you know, banishing meaningful diversity in a model, right? So what is the tension between creating a computational model that is scalable and what is it leaving behind? So my question is, how do we contemplate the non-scalable in, in, within a computational system? Here's where the practice of uh, the reenactment of the Battle of Orgrave, which is a performance piece by artist Jeremy Deller, becomes particularly interesting to me. Uh, Deller kind of used uh, over a thousand people, which uh, 200 were ex miners uh, and a handful of ex policemen, to reenact uh, uh, the encounter between uh, unions, workers, and, and, and the police. Um, this form of twinning, this form of doubling, let's say, uh, this inaction presents us with a kind of a, a rather different ontological proposition, right? One that is not uh, validated by a payoff matrix of 
uh, inputs and outputs on a cybernetic model, but perhaps one that uh, could be considered a form of inaction as cognition, right? And I think that uh, it, it's, it's quite interesting for me to really present these two models as opposing ontologies um, that, that ought to kind of expand different aspects of a project. So these are some of the considerations that were in place when uh, starting to develop and engaging on the production of uh, Commonhood, which is a, a project that I've been working for the past five years and really used um, a lot of the ideas of, uh, let me just, uh, a lot of the ideas of Lockhood, the first video game that I developed, um, but really wanted to add a, a second layer to that, right? So while Commonhood is a video game about a, a community of squatters that are occupying an abandoned factory uh, that are kind of trying to defeat scarcity, very much uh, like Octavia Butler's setting, there's kind of an exaggeration of uh, the precarity of a, a series of individuals after an eviction process. Uh, there is also a narrative layer that really cannot be resolved through the economics of survival, right? The payoff matrix of how do we satisfy survivability within this space is not the full picture, right? And the project really took so long because it really tries to tell the story of 16 characters uh, plus our you know, protagonists in, in, and each one of those are kind of conflicting worldviews uh, that kind of coexist within the space. Um, the game is attempting to create a piece of infrastructure for the development of a DIY architecture, the development of models of uh, literacy and also uh, models of self-provision where people could actually not only design uh, architecture but share that with others, um, create a kind of a form of creative commons repository of architectural uh, um, self-provided and self-provision uh, models, right? Um, but at the same time, it's trying to uh, question where do the designs that we take part on come from? And what are the kind of the social narratives that uh, motivate them? So as I mentioned, this is kind of our opening setting, the encountering of a post-industrial uh, city, one that very much inspired by the city of Detroit. Uh, acknowledges ideas of progress that did not play out the way they were intended um, cities that uh, need to think themselves anew in many ways. Um, and it's placing the player in the position of like, what could you do within these environments, right? What are the kind of communities, what are the kind of relationships that you, you would develop? Uh, and would you follow the steps of a previous generation or would you take that in a different direction? Right? The game is certainly inspired by uh, a large community of architecture, um, you know, communities that, that have to do with digital fabrication and, and production of uh, ideas of technology that, that are very much in the real world um, and inviting the player not only to, to learn their existence, but also manipulate them in such a way that, that they could put forward imaginaries of, of different forms of inhabitation. mentioned the game proposes two forms of cooperation between players uh, one of them being asynchronous meaning that you could share with each other designs and blueprints and, and uh, those could be passed between players uh, critical in this point is that each design is not just something that you can download as a model to kind of use in, in, in your game, but rather it's a kind of an instruction set, it's a tutorial if you want, it's a form of literacy sharing where um, players can see the step-by-step -step process by someone else took to build something, right? So it's not just, hey, I can download that model and, and, and use that, right? But, you know, perhaps we can learn and fork or, you know, branch that model into a, a new proposition. Uh, and these are the kind of the model viewer where people can actually, you know, uh, see the material dependencies and, and 
that each design might have. In a way, the project really tries to uh, simulate an ecology of labor, right? One that is not only looking at actors as economic entities, but rather kind of a more holistic uh, view of their personhood uh, and the kind of social relationships that they might establish uh, as govern governance and their own kind of governance of, of, of their community. The narratives that exist within the characters are not just a side effect or some kind of a narrative setting, but rather integral to the considerations of what a player might do within this space. So maybe to conclude, I would like to go back to the definition of ontology, uh, but specifically that third point. Um, and I read again from Lasser's definition. Ontologies often manifest, manifest themselves as stories. Um, they also exist in the narrative that we modern tell ourselves about ourselves, what is happening in the world. So with that, I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, that was really, really interesting, really great. Um, I have a lot of notes and I'm really excited to be introduced more to your work. Um, I want to see if there are any um, uh, questions. Um, some of the questions that I had, I guess I'll, I'll lead with that, is around, um, I guess, looking at your first project in Blockhood, and then also the idea of twinning. Have you found a way, or is it at all your curiosity or your interest to integrate some of the principles that you're designing for computationally and having them manifest in the real world? And how do you, how do you create that um, relationship between what happens digitally, especially in like architecture that can explore like parametric design or, or even game design where you can play with physics, you can play with some of the like um, more, you can be more free with the constructions of spaces. Um, but if we're looking at the ontologies of stories as, as a, a large value um, to some of the, to contributing to societal configurations, how do we um, bring in some of these digital models or computational models, even the computer generated images that are um, being developed with AI? And how do we integrate that softly and thoughtfully into the physical space and the real world? Right, um, yeah, thank you for that. Um... So I think I, I have a lot of thoughts in regards to the relationship between, you know, any com computational model and reality, right? Um, specifically, I would not want to do a very strong separation between those two, right? Uh, there seems to be a, a tendency to suggest that, well, if the digital model is incredibly accurate, you know, to the degree in which it drives the machine, for fabrication, let's say this is kind of the discourse in architecture. If that model is incredibly accurate, we could actually talk about a digital twin that is, is in fact, you know, uh, a one-to-one -one correlation between the digital and the physical. But I I've observed that every time that we move deeper into the variable of accuracy, we move away from the breadth of the model, meaning what is capable to observe, right? So you suddenly realize that there's a lot of variables that are kind of uh, recede to the background or disappear completely, right? So I'm more interested on like problematizing the ontology of a model in the sense of like who has that voice and not necessarily the, the, like the increasing of accuracy to be able to, to establish that one-to-one -one correlation, right? Uh, I find that, that the space of, you know, that, uh, the argument and the problematization of that ontology or like who has a voice in the model be uh, a slightly more uh, 
uh, opportunistic and fertile territory to really shift the narratives that we have of how such models uh, operate and, and what are the kind of projects that would emerge from such models, right? Uh, because, you know, again, many, many, many times when I see these, these tools, they're using as a form of rhetoric or a form of validation of, of a really established intention. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that there's kind of a rhetoric of computation, rhetoric of per performance, if you want, um, and simulation as a form of, you know, uh, risk management of the future um, <clears throat> that might want to, again, not be aware of certain voices that might might uh, put the model in, in under a big question mark, right? So uh, I don't know. I, I don't see you know the projects trying to become more and more accurate to the like. I think at some point in my career I was attempting to do that, uh, making the models you know the pursuit of precision and, and correlation between model and reality. But uh, at the moment, I think that there is already a, a very strong conversation between communities. And these models, and there's always going to be additional steps uh, that I don't necessarily want to take all myself. I think that it's uh, as you engage with participation, there are going to be different actors that will take different agencies. So, uh, yeah. connected to your question, Carmen, I also we have one question in the YouTube, but I'll get to that because I think they're all um, entangled. Um, I was just thinking, like, it would be incredible if municipalities or urban planners would have access to these sorts of tools, you know, so we can experiment quicker, much faster, and have much more voices heard. I think it was David Graeber who was talking about how um, we were much freer before the civilization, as he puts it, who are formed. We were able to kind of experiment with a lot of governing, a lot of uh, distributing the commons, etc. And I think these sorts of games, which I think it's like a really large, actually, term for this it's much more than a game i would say would be an incredible tool uh in the hands of um like city planners and maybe even at schools and liva here um uh, has one question um he's she says she's super interesting things to discuss i would like to ask about the common hood game i have worked a lot she has worked a lot herself in post-industrial cities or soon to become one and she's curious about the audience response to the game. And if you would like to know who are the participants or to put in other words, think about the potential of the game as a tool to imagine alternative futures or even alternative presence, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, in many ways, uh, I, I shared with you a little bit in the, in the talk about the, the painful, almost painful aspect of uh, engaging with this process of participation. I, I say that because the project went live, uh, I think, two weeks ago, 10th of November. Uh, and we've been getting so much feedback from it. Uh, some of them being like, you know, very loving comments about, you know, what could be done with the project and certainly some criticism as well. Maybe some technical criticism about things that shortcomings of the software in terms of things that we could do better. And we're working hard on improving that. But it's exciting and, you know, it's certainly emotional in a way because you are kind of try to engage with a conversation. It's not like a finished book that is written and it's out there, right? But like it really requires kind of a, an engagement, right? So we do have a, a Discord server. We do, um, that's kind of our current form of engagement. We have a large community there where uh, there's conversations about the narrative, about the game, about the, the software itself, about the models of economy that, that are kind of modeled within the game, where the game can go in the future. So it's, it's certainly more uh, feedback that, you know, us as a small studio can really take. Um, so there's, there's kind of, a, I think, a, um, a relationship that uh, this project, in a way, it's not completed and will continue growing, I think, for, for many years. Um, how it would actually manifest itself in terms of, as, as you mentioned, uh, the idea of working with a municipality or a city like Detroit or certain communities or in some case, maybe some people in the community have been talking about maybe building a tiny house with with software and kind of sharing blueprints of how do you kind of kind of design and also share those blueprints with others about uh, a tiny house construction. Those are things that I, I really love and, and I would certainly kind of continue, would like to continue supporting. Um, but yeah, I think that that conversation is uh, central to these projects. They're not projects that are meant to be 
finished and kind of move on, but rather kind of their life. And uh, the response has been a, a conversation as like any kind of civic engagement. I felt like there is a, of course you could say, well, this is a product, right? Like, so people are demanding, they're reviewing this project as a, as a service. But I think that there is a, an intention that this project would also a, have something to say about the way we design architecture, the way we design CDs. And, a, you know, some, maybe a subset of people would actually engage with that. Um, so yeah, I think it's, we're in the process of parsing a, a large number of voices and, and responding in, in different angles to, 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 to what is being discussed, right? Um, so yeah, like me, my presentations are often like certainly a, as aspirational in terms of what these projects might wanna do. And for a long time, I've been talking about the projects in the future but suddenly it's in the present, right? Uh, so uh, this is this is kind of that entangled reality that we, like I feel like I wanna convey. There's like, I'm part of it as much as, you know, the development team, but also like the players and it's kind of a live conversation. At the moment. So if, if anybody would like to, you know, participate in that either here or further, uh, the invitation is to kind of join our kind of Discord server. And we're kind of very active there. And have you found um, in the responses and the output, which can can be challenging because like the gaming communities have a lot of expectations and uh, require um, a lot of engagement, I would say, like technical as well as narrative, as well as uh, communal. Um, <clears throat> have you had any surprises or anything that's come out of it that's made that I guess you hadn't thought about and that um, you might want to integrate or some, I guess, because these kind of ideas and spaces and platforms give you the chance to have like an open dialogue, right, with your community. And potentially because it is a morphing and evolving um, game or experience, though you can and you have the power to integrate some of the ideas um maybe it's too soon for you to say that um and as a design as like the designer sometimes there's things that you're also like very in love with and that you feel like you have to hold on to um but have there been anything so far i guess in both pro both of your game sound projects that have like surprised you um, that come from very different worldviews that maybe you wouldn't have necessarily implemented? So, yeah, certainly. I mean, I think that that conversation happens often and my, you know, my, my blind spots in a way uh, or our blind spots as a team uh, are constantly being, you know, demonstrated by my commentary in, in conversations in the community, right? And, and I think that one of the biggest challenges is not technical it's certainly more about communication. And I think the, the kind of the crafting of common ground, if you want, right? A lot of the conversations have to do with uh, accessibility, points of entry, uh, things that we take for granted. And, and this might be maybe a boring answer because we wanna, you know, maybe hear, you know, I never thought of this fantastic game mechanic that someone suggested and suddenly like, that's brilliant. It's actually a lot more subtle than that. It's about how someone else that is not you understands and ramps into kind of an idea of uh, what you're doing here in this space, right? It's like, how, when do you feel alienated? When do you feel like, like I'm not following? Like, of course you're talking to what people have, you know, discussed as non-expert users. I don't like the idea of distinction between experts and non-experts, but I do think that there's kind of a ladder uh, of, of, of different roles that people will take, uh, different literacies, right? So the awareness of, of of where you are standing and what do you know uh, and, and how do you kind of move in within the space of what the project is proposing is always a uh, kind of you know an exploration right because um mm, i yeah, love that do, answer yeah that's great um i wanted to jump to another question from fabio uh they say loved the cybersyn mention do you see potential in video games as means to create new forms of cybernetics or distributed support systems for the economy um yeah absolutely i think that i've been i've been following for quite some time different kind of projects uh, there's the ai economies project which is an ai uh, really speculating on 
on different economic models uh, from capitalism, communism, and anything in between to really kind of talk about performance and you know a, a different forms of uh, inequality, right? Uh, and while an AI can do that, I think that there's also an argument for the kind of systems that people come up with. And I think that there was a project for some time, a video game called Seed, that was really playing with the notion of how how do we tinker with different forms of governance uh, so that you would have like many, many planets and maybe some planets would be run very differently than others, right? Uh, maybe along the lines of what Ursula K. Le Guin did with the novel The Dispossessed in a way. Um, and I find that that idea beautiful. In many ways, some of the things that we could not include much more into common food was a, almost the, the crafting of a governing structure, right? And I think that that's where the, the work perhaps wants to go in the future. Um, how do you play with the, the way in which capital is distributed, the way in which uh, resources are, uh, and, and labor, it's kind of, uh, you know, managed, even if it's just a small economy within, within this kind of squatter community, right? And there's a reflection of like, there is a lot of malleability perhaps on, on, on this kind of narrativized community uh, about the kind of you know governing structures or what can we do different? I think that that's very in line with the conversations that we're having nowadays in architecture, with uh, questioning models of property like community land trusts or cooperatives. Again, there've been searches of conversations about commons and and, and different forms of, of governance for both uh, material resources and, and and like online communities and digital resources. So. Um, that's very much the context in which this operates. Um, I, I'm perhaps a bit early to kind of have any kind of definitive claims of how the project kind of innovates in, in that regard. I would say that uh, there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's a direction to kind of explore that more in the future, I guess. Carmen, you're on mute. I also was uh, going to say, and I think somebody also asked, would love to join the Discord. Is it invite only? <laughs> no, okay. it's actually completely public. Um, okay, so all right. I'm, I'm happy to share that. That'll, that'll be great. We'll also share it with uh, in the comments later on. Carmen, you are on mute. Um, well, I was, and I, I was thinking, and of course, this kind of these conversations kind of collide or tend toward then crypto and alternative commerce. And I was just curious about in the game and if you're distributing, um, and maybe this isn't more of a like resource management um, question, but like how do you echo some of these concepts then when you're trying to build the game? Um, and which is like a, designing video games is very costly. There's a lot to to do. Um, there's a lot of work. There's um, So there is an economic model that hasn't necessarily been left yet in order to produce some of these um, situations or opportunities that give us the chance to look at what economic less models would be. Yeah. Um, and so I was, I guess, it, curious about um, how you saw alternative currencies and um, how you're applying that within architecture. And if you are doing that, or if you're kind of leaving that to be a separate um, provocation in itself. Yeah, so when we were developing this project, it's not, I mean, it, it wasn't during that time, certainly, but like the big conversation about cryptocurrencies uh, and, and blockchain technology really kind of you know, started kind of being more uh, pervasive and the, the game really proposes a kind of a form of user uh, generated content that we thought, hey, it would be great to have a, like people should own their own model and we certainly stand behind that and they could perhaps mint that model and, and have an economy. Um, there are, as you mentioned, the technological and kind of shortcomings to be able to implement all that. We are kind of a small team of three people at the moment. So like uh, the expectation of really creating kind of a, uh, a whole economy where players could actually just exchange um, those models. So we've currently have adopted a kind of creative commons approach to the, the content, right? We don't claim to own any of that content. That content is from the players. And if there's a repository of knowledge being produced, it's kind of in, 
should be owned, in my view, by the players. But there should be, perhaps, if you're kind of considering that form of gameplay labor, there should be an option to to decide, right? What what do you how do you kind of you know uh, what do you want to do with that? If you want to extract it as a as a form of you know exporting it or kind of minting it or do anything you want with that, and we certainly want to support those conversations in in, in any way that is possible. Uh, the way in which we we are kind of really open right now is to really kind of how do we bring democracy to the software, right? Do we do that through kind of opening doors for further software development through a modding culture, which is very strong in, in the gaming world where people, different entities, different communities could expand the software in different directions. Um, or do we have a, a method by which, you know, players are able to kind of uh, have a say on what, what kind of features, what kind of content ought to be included, right? And I think that um, both perhaps could be interesting. I think that we want to continue working on the project and expanding certain uh, ideas, but at the same time, we certainly want to open that for others that might want to, uh, in, in, in the context of commons, there's this notion of stewardship, right? If you want to just, you know, uh, if you want to hang out within this space and, and really kind of participate on it, um, you start claiming ownership over the different areas. So I, I, I find that could be really beautiful. Um, obviously, it's quite uncharted territory for me. Uh, how are we going to implement that? I think that it, it's about some technology, some amount of communication and, and, and community engagement. So we're really kind of starting to figure out what would be the framework for that. But, but certainly, how do we bring uh, democracy to software development and, and the future of the project is, is central to how the project should develop in the future. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, for ha for coming and for everyone who's joined us. Um, Edja, do you have any other questions? No, wonderful. I have to digest it all. And yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> we start playing it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jose, for joining us. This was Thank incredible. you for having me. Yeah, and yes, we will. And feel free to join us in the next lecture, uh, which will be happening on um, December 2nd, uh, and we will see you guys soon. Thank you all. Thanks for having me. Bye.